Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Bayless Conley. Hello friend, welcome to the broadcast today. We're going to be talking about something that is actually really necessary for you to hear. We're going to be talking about the necessities of life. There, there's all things, there, there's things that all of us rather would love to do. There's things that are important, but then there's things that are above that that are necessary. It's not really optional, you know, for our well-being, for our future, if we do them or we don't do them. And the scriptures talk about things that God deems as necessary. So let's get into this necessary message about necessary things. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. Should you please open your Bible to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. We'll be looking at some verses there in a, a few moments. Before we do, just want to let you know something. I have never been a car guy. You know, everybody's got their, their deals that they're into, but I've never been a car guy. Out of necessity, I've learned to do certain things to keep a car running, but I was never the guy that took auto shop class in high school. It's just never been my, my deal. But I do remember there was a guy, when I was in high school, he was rebuilding a 1963 Ford Galaxy 500 engine. It had been pulled out. Uh, of an old Ford Galaxy, and if I recall, those old standard engines were a 289 V8. And he basically was kind of rebuilding the thing from the ground up, and there was sort of a buzz around school because it was a, a Herculean task, and this guy was at it for months. And though I wasn't a car guy, I actually poked my head into the auto shop class several times to see this guy's progress on the engine. And I remember the day he was finished, and they were going to fire the engine up. People were standing all around it, and sure enough, he fires it up, and it roars to life, and everybody claps. And then after a minute, it started to smoke, and it just seized up. He neglected to put oil in it. Yeah. And for those of you that are less car people than I am, oil's pretty important to an engine. Sort of like having blood in your body. It's not going to run without it. He somehow didn't realize the necessity of putting oil in that engine before he started it. And you know, whenever the scriptures tell us that something is necessary, we best pay heed. And I just want to share with you six necessary things that the scriptures declare to us today and uh, trust that you'll get something for it. The first one is this. Unhurried time in the Word is necessary. Unhurried time in the Word. Luke 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. One thing is needed. One thing is necessary. And Mary chose it. She was sitting at his feet, hearing his word. She wasn't bustling about, catching a word here and catching a sentence there. But she lingered in his presence to drink in his word. And of course, it was a very different story with Martha. It says she was distracted with much serving. The word distracted literally means to be pulled away. And the original language gives the idea that Martha as well was perhaps sitting and listening to Jesus teach, but she got pulled away because of much serving. Now, friends, serving is good, but not at the expense of having a lean soul. Mary made a choice, and it takes a choice 
to put down or postpone other things in order to do the necessary, to linger undistractedly in God's book. And whether you do that on your own with your cup of coffee at the kitchen table early in the morning or in a small group where you have time to ask questions and, and throw things around and, and, you know, really get into the Word, it's important that we all do it. Job 23, 12 said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Sometimes it is advantageous to skip a natural meal in order to partake of a spiritual meal. Look with me at Matthew 15, a very familiar story where there are thousands of people gathered in the wilderness to partake of Christ's ministry. They are receiving healing, and he is teaching them. If you compare the different gospel writers, he healed all that came to him, and he spoke to them of the kingdom. In Matthew 15 and verse 32, it says, Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where can we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Now, of course, we know the story. Jesus ends up multiplying the loaves and the fishes and feeds thousands of people. But I want you to consider, they've continued with him three days in the wilderness and they've run out of food. Jesus said they have nothing to eat, and he literally was concerned that if they tried to go, you know, to a, a village that might have been nearby, they may have fainted on the way. These people definitely considered and treasured the words of his mouth more than their necessary food. You know, I remember as a, a new Christian, some of my new Christian friends dragged me to a meeting, I didn't want to go. There was an evangelist teacher ministering, and I told him I was going to go, but then I just wasn't feeling well. They came to get me, said, no, you guys, go on. I'm not coming. I was laying in the bed. And they said, no, Bayless, you're coming. I said, no, I'm not. Go on. They said, you're coming. I said, I'm not. And they literally grabbed my arm and pulled me out of the bed. I will forever be grateful for their insistence. That night, the evangelist taught on the parable of the sower, and God opened my eyes that night. I saw the importance of God's word, how that virtually everything that God does in us and through us, he does it through his word. It changed my life forever. A love affair started that night with God's book that hasn't ceased to this day, more than 40 years later. I can remember, you know, I, I followed that poor evangelist everywhere he went in the state of Oregon. I think he must have thought I was a stalker, because I, I showed up at every meeting, no matter where he was in the state, I, I showed up in the meetings. And um, I remember one time he was up in a little mountain community. I only had enough fuel in my van to get up there. I didn't have money to buy gas to get home. I had no money for food, and I had no place to stay. I was going to stay, sleep in the car. And it didn't bother me. It's like those weren't even issues. I was going to hear the Word of God taught in a way that I had never heard it taught, and it was changing my life. My friend, unhurried time in his word is so important. His word builds us up and brings us into our inheritance. It is necessary. It's food for our spirit. It's our light in a dark place. It's necessary. It frees us and strengthens us and reveals right and wrong to us and reveals God to us. It is necessary. It instructs us in relationships, in finances, in child rearing, in governing, in work ethics, in worship. It is necessary. It fills us with hope and faith and is our weapon in the place of prayer. It is necessary, but without it, we're blind and hopeless and faithless, adrift on a sea of human opinion and philosophies that change with every generation and is powerless to bring us to God. His word is necessary. We need to read it, consider it, reflect on it, pray it, confess it, act on it, and then read it some more. Unhurried time in the book. All right, number two, number two, and it's related to the first one. 
It's necessary to have patience to see the promises fulfilled. Patience is necessary if we're going to see his promises fulfilled. Look in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, in verses 35 and 36. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance or patience, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You have need. It is necessary for you to have patience, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise, the promise singular. In its context, it's talking about carrying on in your walk with God because Christ will indeed return and heaven is indeed laid up to your account. We have an eternity with him laid out before us. It is a promise that we will one day walk in. But we need endurance. Patience is necessary because this world is not always fair and it is not always kind. When you embrace Christ and begin to walk with him, in a sense, you're swimming upstream in a downstream world. And it does take endurance and it does take patience. Now, certainly that, that applies to the promise of, of his return and enjoying heaven with him. But it goes beyond that and it's applicable to every, pro, every promise. Look in Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 11 and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises, plural. So we need to imitate those, plural, that have seen and realized the promises of God, seen them fulfilled in their life, and they were realized through faith and patience. Patience is that force that keeps our faith applied until the answer comes, until the promise comes to pass. You may be familiar with the book of Daniel. It's an intriguing book in the Bible. And actually in the ninth chapter, the angel Gabriel appears to Daniel and starts talking to him about the Messiah and about the end times. And then Gabriel makes this statement to him that was quite cryptic. Said, and Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Well, Daniel doesn't know what that means. And that's a pretty startling thing. Here, you know, the Jewish Messiah is going to come, but he's going to be cut off, but not for himself. Like what? Now looking, you know, on this side of the cross, we understand he was cut off, that we might be grafted into a relationship with God. But Daniel wouldn't have understood that at all. And so he immediately begins to pray and seek God for wisdom. And you know what? An angel, another angel is dispatched with an answer to Daniel's request. And when the angel shows up and talks to Daniel with the answer to his prayer, this is what the angel said to him. And I read to you from Daniel chapter 10. Then he said, don't be frightened, Daniel, for your request has been heard in heaven and was answered the very first day you began to fast before the Lord and pray for understanding. That very day I was sent here to meet you. But for 21 days, the mighty evil spirit who overrules the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the top officers of the heavenly army, came to help me so that I was able to break through these spirit rulers of Persia. Now Daniel was a captive in Babylon, in the ancient nation of Persia, the empire of Persia, modern-day Iran. And back then, it encompassed what is Iraq and Iran. And uh, the angel said, look, from the day you prayed, the day you made your request, I was sent. God heard your prayer that day, and I was dispatched with the answer. But for 21 days, Daniel, unbeknownst to you, a spiritual conflict has been raging. And these evil spirits that, that rule over this, this ancient empire of Persia that are puppeting its rulers, you know, making them dance on a string, they have been endeavoring to block my way from, being, from bringing the answer for 21 days. And what if Daniel would have quit after a week? Say, man, this isn't working. God's not listening to me. Man, I've been praying for a week. What if he would have quit after two weeks? Say, man, this isn't working. You know, heaven is silent. I mean, God's just not interested in answering this prayer. What if he would have quit after 20 days? No, he had to exercise patience. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 18. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again, 
but Satan hindered us. My friend, we are in a spiritual conflict. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit realm. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, now the devil may succeed in delaying some things, but he can never deny as long as we keep our faith applied with a cooperating force of patience. You know, after I got saved, one of my chief concerns was the salvation of my family. I began to earnestly pray for my dad, my mother, and my sister, for them all to come to Christ. And um, I eventually moved back to California from Oregon, and I, I remember praying almost the entire time I drove, hours and hours and hours, just praying for them. And there were some verses in the Bible that I've been meditating on and thinking about, in particular Acts 16.31, when the Philippian jailer after the earthquake, you know, he sprang in and said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul looked at him and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your household. And I've just been thinking about that over and over and praying earnestly for my parents, and I can tell you where the quarter dropped. I was driving down the grapevine, and all of a sudden, it's like that promise became real to me. I felt like the Holy Spirit had illuminated in my heart, and I knew I had my answer. I knew my family would be saved. I just knew it. And if you've ever had a promise illuminated in your heart or a scripture illuminated in you, you know what I'm talking about. I just knew that I knew that I knew. But when I got home, it sure didn't seem like it at first. Nobody was that happy to see me. Some months later, I took my sister and a girlfriend of hers to Calvary Chapel to hear one of the early Maranatha bands. I think it was Odin Fong and Mustard Seed Faith. And she and her little friend went forward and gave their lives to Jesus. My mom, she wasn't so easy. I remember we're in the airport one day, and I've got this little Gideon Bible. I mean, the print is so small, you almost have to have a magnifying glass to read it. I'm reading this tiny little Gideon Bible. She said, you have to have that thing out. That is so embarrassing. You're just making a scene. You just want to show off, and you're embarrassing us all. Put that away. I mean, she just went off on me for, for having this little Gideon Bible out. Well, sometime later, she got saved, and Spirit Phil started carrying a 10-pound Bible with her <laughs> everywhere she went, blowing on somebody's coffee table. And then my dad, he was the last one to come. It took several years. I remember one day, he said, look, son, I just want to tell you, I liked you better when you were on drugs. But dad got saved and spirit-filled as well. But it didn't happen immediately. There was plenty of obstacles, plenty of opportunities to quit and say, all right, God didn't hear my prayer. This isn't going to happen. In fact, everything looks like it's going the opposite way. No, it's through faith and patience. You have need of endurance. Patience is necessary if we're going to receive the promise, if we're going to see those promises fulfilled. All right, number three. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And this third necessary thing is every member of the church is necessary. Every member of the church is necessary. Now, Paul, he's writing, and he comes up with this analogy that the church is like a human body. One person's an ear, somebody else is an eye, somebody else is, you know, is this or that. You know, that everyone has a unique function but the body is still one. And he said, that's what the church is like. And in verse 20 of chapter 12, he said, but now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Even the parts of the body that you, you can't understand their function, they are necessary. Even if they seem to be a liability, a weakness, they are necessary. You know, when I was a little boy, most doctors thought that our tonsils were unnecessary. In fact, we were taught in school, I was taught in school as a little boy, that our tonsils were just left over from evolution and they were slowly, slowly going away, that they served no purpose at all. Consequently, if your tonsils ever got swollen and you got a sore throat, out they came. And the carrot at the end of the stick, you get ice cream. 
as much as you want. You get to eat lots of ice cream. So listen, there are many, many adults around my age that no longer have their tonsils. And I remember saying to my mom, Mom, I want my tonsils out. I get ice cream. And it's like two-thirds of the kids in my class have their tonsils out. First sore throat, yep, take them in, out with the tonsils. That they said that they don't serve a purpose, just a leftover, you know, bit from evolution that, that hasn't quite disappeared yet. But now medical science realizes that the tonsils are the, one of the body's first lines of defense against viruses, infections, and germs. They're part of our immune system, and when they're at work, they get swollen and the throat gets sore when they're doing their job. And when you don't have them, your body's immune system is not quite as strong. Now, there are some people in the church that may seem to be unnecessary, but they have a function. <laughs> hey, I'm convinced there are some people, they just carry a good spirit with them. They don't have a bad thing to say about the church. They love their pastors. They love the church. And it just kind of gets off on other people. Man, they're so valuable. There are others. No one sees what they do. No one knows. But they get on their knees and they pray for their church. And they keep out spiritual germs and viruses. And they are so valuable. And I guess I just want to say to all you tonsils out there, <laughs> we love you. You are necessary. We need you. You are not a fifth wheel. All right, number four, the fourth necessary thing, words that build up others. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, words that build up others. Ephesians 4 and 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The word edification or to edify means to build up. And this verse says it's necessary. Now, I think few people realize the impact that their words have. Very little of what we say falls into the area of being neutral. Most everything that we say, almost everything we say, and the way we say it either corrupts or builds up. It either degrades and tears down he said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only what's good for necessary building up. Very little of what we say and the way we say it falls into this arena of being neutral. Almost everything we say, it does one or the other. It tears down or it builds up. And my goodness, we're living in a world that needs to be strengthened, needs to be built up. It says, speak words that impart grace to the hearers. Words impart things to people. Words are containers, and they impart what they contain to the hearers. They impart strength and healing and life and peace and comfort and faith and hope. Or they can impart heaviness, anger, despair, discouragement, and unbelief. Bedankt voor het kijken naar Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Volgende week deel 2 van deze preek. Did you know that Jesus said by our words we're justified and by our words we will be condemned? He said that we'll be in judgment for every idle or non-productive word that we have spoken. Words, though they seem little, are big things with God and they have huge impacts upon people's lives. So choose your words carefully. Speak words of faith. Speak words of hope. Put the words of God in your mouth and do your best to encourage others. And let me just tell you this as I close today. You may not hear it very often at all in your personal world, but I want to tell you, you are loved. You're loved by God more than you can comprehend it. You're loved fiercely by God. You are valuable to Him, so valuable that He gave up heaven's most important being for you. He gave his only son who died on the cross for your sins, was raised from the dead so that you might come into God's family. Why don't you come today? Heeft u genoten van deze boodschap? Bestel dan de volledige preek op cd of dvd. De contactgegevens staan nu in beeld. We bidden dat u blijft groeien in wijsheid, geloof en de kracht door Gods woord.
And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. There is a story in 2 Kings chapter 6 where the school of the prophets are needing to expand. They're operating under the authority of Elisha and as one of them is cutting down a tree to help build a bigger uh, school, the ax head flies off the end of the ax and ends up in the water. And he goes, oh, master, what do I do? It was borrowed. And he reminds me of so many people. Basically, he lost his cutting edge. And, uh, you know, he was involved in the work of God, but he, he lost his edge. And you may be listening to me right now, and you've lost your sensitivity to the Spirit. You've, you've lost your joy. You know, you, you've ceased to grow in God. Basically, you've lost your cutting edge. The question is, how do you get it back? And I love the story, it's so simple. It said, the man of God said, where did it fall? That's where you have to start. You need to ask, where did I lose my cutting edge? Maybe uh, you lost your cutting edge um, because someone offended you. Maybe, uh, you know, you just started hanging around with the wrong people and uh, you, uh, you know, slip back into some, some things that were not healthy for you spiritually. And then the story goes on that the man of God, he, he cut down a stick and he threw it in the water and the iron began to float. The, the iron axe had came up out of the mud and began, began to swim in the waters. And, you know, for us that stick, it represents Calvary. And if you've lost your cutting edge, don't blame anyone else. You take personal responsibility for it. Apply Calvary and the blood of Christ that was shed there. Repent and He will cleanse you from all sin. If you'll repent and say, God, I want my edge back, He'll, he'll bring you back to that point where you can reach out and take it. But you have to reach out by faith and say, God, I'm getting right with you again. I'm, I'm going to renew my relationship with you again. So I want to encourage you, reach out and take it. Regain your cutting edge and start going forward in the things of God once again. Hi there. I have a resource entitled Footprints of Faith that I believe will be a blessing to you. There's a book included in it as well as several teachings on CD. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God and I'm going to tell you without faith it's impossible to walk with God. This resource is going to help you in your daily journey with the Lord. Footprints of Faith. Learn to recognize and follow God's leading and see His power at work in your life. This booklet and three message series teaches you the benefits and blessings tied to obediently putting one foot in front of the other by faith, even when you can't see the outcome. So request this faith building resource today. Just use the information on your screen. Footprints of Faith.